Uh, I want to read to you from uh, the passage of Luke, chapter 12, verses of 49 to 56. I came to bring fire to the earth, but how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? But why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? Thus, when you go with your accuser before a magistrate on the way, make an effort to settle the case or you will be dragged before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and then the officer throw you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last enemy. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, from the busyness of Christmas, we are able to dial down into some days of rest before the new year. We ask that you come into our lives in this time of down, of rest, that we may then be able to concentrate on you, what you would have us to be and to do in your new time. Amen. Now, the text for this sermon puts forth a question whose answer might have been different had you and I been asked to respond, for we would no doubt have answered in the affirmative, and rightly so, for we would have proof in Scripture to support us. Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Jesus did come to bring peace. Jesus did come to inaugurate the peaceable kingdom, and this is affirmed by his very name. He is the Prince of Peace. Throughout his ministry, he told more than one distraught individual to go in peace. Finally, Jesus affirmed peace by the legacy that he left to us upon his earthly departure. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. But regardless of our affirmations that Jesus came to bring peace, he answers his own question with a negative. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Instead of division, Matthew chapter 10 uses the word sword, which shocks us even more. Here then is the Prince of Peace declaring that he has not come to bring peace but a sword, a division. As one biblical commentator tells us concerning the text verse found in Matthew, the main import of these words is not literal. The confession of Christ is brought in actuality, the sword of persecution 
and there has been behind our wars a conflict of life views, one being more Christian than the other. But there is no justification here for the war method, not, not while the Sermon on the Mount remains. Luke's version gives us the meaning of the word sword. Do you think I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. The saying holds of, 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 of any new idea, really. There are ancient Babylonian inscriptions which endorse it. The idea of an eight-hour day in history split business and politics into two different camps. So did the idea of one world and the movement against slavery. And step toward public housing project divides people into for and against, not without strife. But Christ is more than an outstanding instance of this division. He is the instance. For our interpretation of heaven and earth and our whole manner of life turn on him. Now, thus it is that the Prince of Peace has come as a disturber, a creator of discord and disharmony. So it would seem to us. Surely this is a paradox that needs explanations. Jesus, in fact, was a disturber. He was a creator of division. He was and is the most disturbing personality that ever lived on this earth. Much of the testimony offered during his trial was false, but there was one charge, one charge that had validity to it because many people could have been called upon to support it. That charge leveled by the council of chief priests and scribes was this. He stirs up the people in Luke chapter 23. Indeed, Jesus did just that. He stirred up the people. Village after village, even the entire nation, felt the impact of his personality. People became restless and uncomfortable. Because of Christ, or those who before had been disturbed became comforted, and those who previously had been comfortable had now become disturbed. In Luke chapter 4, we read that Jesus attended the synagogue on the Sabbath, the synagogue with its atmosphere of serenity and calmness, its attitude of escape from the hard realities of life. Jesus read the lesson for the day. That beautiful passage from Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2, which begins, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. As he began his sermon, the congregation became spellbound with him. Truly, this service would be a highlight of their lives. Then Jesus started to make references to certain outsiders. There were many lepers in Israel during the days of Elisha the prophet, he declared, but not one of them had faith to be healed. The only man possessed of such faith was a foreigner, a Syrian, called Naaman. There were many widows in Israel where Elijah had a price on his head and he was hunting for a house to stay in for safety. But the one, the widow, who dared give him shelter, the only one, was a pagan of the land from which Jezebel came. At this point, the congregation became angry, turned into a mob, and threw Jesus out of the city. Then, too, there was that lunatic. Remember him who lived in a cemetery near the village of Gadara? His name was Legion. Once in a while, this man, Legion, would act out. 
but it was only occasional. Along came Jesus. No sinner had he arrived than he, than he healed the sick man. Seeing this cured basket case sitting on the Lord's feet, once again, in his full mind, the crowd became excited. For it seems that the cure called for the hogs to be sacrificed. That was too much for the practical oriented people. What is to be done with a man who thinks more of a bit of human wreckage than of a herd of good hogs? Not daring to try to expel such a powerful personality themselves, a good, in very good church tradition, it must have been Presbyterian, they appointed a committee to go and request Jesus to leave their region. For as you may know, the person who puts human values first over hogs or guns or politics or monetary considerations is always a disturber. Yes, Jesus disturbed churches and villages, but he also disturbed individuals. Remember the rich young Euler, ruler I preached on him here that honored the well-respected uh, your traditions of his time, youth, wealth, status, position, he had it made. All the glitters were his and he was contented until Jesus came along. When this young aristocratic socialite heard about this traveling Messiah and how unselfish he was with his life, he became shall we say, squeamish. The conflict reached within, really reached a climax point one day when he heard that Jesus was nearby. So bothered, so disturbed was he that he, he ran out to the present teacher asking how to find life. Sad to say, the price was higher than he was willing to pay. He could not divest himself of his holdings and his status. After all, what would everybody think? Even though he went away, he did not go joyfully. He went with an ache in his heart. Jesus, you see, robbed this young ruler of some of his faults, peace. Or take the revolutionary on one of the two crosses beside Jesus. He was a tough dude. He was a revolutionary who knew what he had been doing and was, and was willing to die for his cause. Having been caught, his only regret was that he had not done more violence. Bravely did he go up the hill to Calvary straight up the hill did he carry his own cross, and he was determined to die just as he had fought, macho style. But once upon his own cross, something happened. What attention, intention he had possessed for his life and for his death, what plans and attitudes he had were, uh, were his were now thrown into turmoil. He was seeing himself against the pure, innocent background of the man on the center cross. His pain was not in being where he was, it was in being what he was. Then came his words, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingly power. Thus, Jesus did divide people within themselves. He divided one from another. Some who touched him loved him with a love that nothing could kill. Others hated him with a hatred that nailed him to a cross. These two groups were divided. Jesus was a disturber who had come to bring division 
to the world his cross is either a pathetic and ironic tragedy or it is redemption. Neutrality is not possible. We are either for him or we are against him. William Barclay writes, the essence of Christianity is that loyalty to Christ has to take precedence over the dearest loyalty of this earth. Why is this the case? First of all, Jesus disturbs us by being what he is. Years ago, each worker in the Hughes Mission in London wore a white carnation. One day, one of these workers sat in, uh, at a table talking with a young woman who had become an outcast from her family and her friends. Suddenly, she burst into tears, which puzzled the worker because the conversation was not of anything that would elicit emotions. When the worker tried to ask her why the tears, the young woman touched the white flower and said, I am not like that. I wish I were white and clean like that flower. When you and I come face to face with the Christ, we are forced to say, I am not like that. He does disturb us by being what and who he is. Then too, Jesus disturbs us of our set purposes. God strives with us here and now with patient persistence. Jesus could have passed under that sycamore tree and not even notice little Zacchaeus up in the branches. But he did not do that. He said, come down, little man. I want to make you a bigger person in the kingdom of God. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus could have walked by the shore and talked with Simon and Andrew about the weather or about good fishing, something safe, you know, to talk about, and just kept on going. But he did not do that. Jesus said to them, drop everything and follow me now. Constantly, Jesus is saying to you and to me, Behold, I stand at the door of your life and knock. Jesus will never permit any one of us to sleep our way into heaven without doing his best to rouse us out of our moles into which we have set ourselves. Moles which, which, like some new cement, have hardened. Our dissatisfaction with ourselves, our longing to be better individuals, our zeal to be of service in the church and the community, all these are but the prelude to peace. They are the disturbing voices of the Lord calling us to utilize our potentials as Christians and to realize our best possibilities of service in the mission of his kingdom. If we are comfortable as we are as Christian persons and as a church, if we are withholding or not giving what we should to the Lord's work, and I'm talking here about money, if we feel that we are about as good as we could ever be and that we can be no better or that we can't do any more, if we are withholding back from God, then we need to be blasted from our lethargy and our smugness by the persistent Christ who by his prodding after us to climb still higher in our spiritual commitment is there in our lives to bring us his peace. Why does the Christ disturb us? What is his purpose? 
By us moving, by his moving us off of dead center, Jesus is robbing us of our false peace in order to give us a peace that is real. For we can be sure that Jesus came to usher in his peaceable kingdom, but he can give us peace only through our cooperation. Peace is a consequence, an effect, rather than a cause. To find peace in our lives, we must be willing to meet the conditions of peace. We must be willing to give up whatever is antagonistic to us in, uh, in the development of peace. If we cannot do this, like the rich young ruler, we will go away sorrowing. <clears throat> Because unless we meet these conditions, not even God himself can give us his peace. If we cannot do this, we are like the rich young ruler. We go away soaring because we cannot meet these conditions. An ingrown toenail is painful. Putting a bandage over it won't do any good. What is needed may be our going after it with some instruments that in the process of removing the cause of our pain will cause us more pain temporarily. Jesus declared that there are ills which demand spiritual surgery. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, that is, we must be willing to get rid of that which disturbs our peace, even though the very ridding of it may in itself be as painful. When Isaiah said, there is no peace for the wicked, he was stating a fact. Paul was speaking to the same purpose when he said, for the kingdom of God does not mean food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in, in, within the Holy Spirit. We are not so naive to believe that peace comes merely from having plenty to eat and drink. Full and fat people become sleepy and lazy, and those qualities do not lead us anywhere but to an easy chair of complacency. Before there can be any real peace, there must be righteousness. This means rightness. Rightness with God. Rightness within ourselves. Rightness between each other. Rightness within the peaceable kingdom. How then shall we find peace? It is an individual matter whereby we give ourselves totally to the Prince of Peace. Years and years ago, a missionary told this story. As I was coming down the Himalaya mountains, I saw a man climbing in the distance to meet me. As he drew near to each, as we drew nearer to each other, I heard the clank of chains as he got closer still, I could see that he had a huge chain around his neck that was tearing into his flesh. I asked him to tell me his story. He told me that a few years before he had gone to the priest in search of peace. The priest told him to, to then perform certain extremely difficult acts of penance. He obeyed, but as yet he had not found his peace. Finally, the priest put this heavy chain around his neck and told him to climb to the summit of the mountain, which he was now doing. As the missionary continued, he said, when I heard this story, I reached up and I took the chain from his neck. I sat down with him and I began to tell him about the Prince of Peace. I told him that peace was a gift of Jesus Christ which he could receive by giving of himself. The man listened very carefully and then all at once the light of understanding came into his eyes. 
It was as if he had been pulled out from under a tremendous burden. The last I saw him, he was going back down the mountain to share this news with his family and with his neighbors. <clears throat> yes, Jesus Christ came to bring peace on this earth. Peace to your heart and peace to my heart. Peace throughout the world. It is his kind of peace, but it is not for the passive person. The peace of Jesus Christ is only for those who first, as a prelude, are willing to give their very all to him. What follows from that is the peaceable kingdom. And what follows from that is life. Amen. <clears throat>